Closing keynote is tech for good at scale. Um, and we're going to be uh, Laura Goodwin, who's BBC's uh, innovation correspondent, is going to be interviewing Catherine Baddeley, who is head of corporate social responsibility for Cisco UK and Ireland, um, talking about uh, the breadth and scale of Cisco's ambition. And Cisco's ambition is pretty bold and uh, hugely impressive and makes my head hurt, so it must make your head hurt, um, is to um, impact positively a billion lives by 2025. So if you're talking about big goals, there's one, but already well on the way, and, and that's what this session is going to be all about. So just a little bit about each um, uh, of our two guests on the stage. So Laura has been a journalist for 15 years. Um, you'll recognize her from um, BBC Innovation, BBC Click, started a career in uh, Maury Firth Radio has been to STV and now at BBC uh, and backed by popular demand. She, you uh, interviewed on the first uh, Tech for Good Summit, so welcome back. And Catherine, as I said, is head of corporate social responsibility for Cisco UK and Ireland. Uh, she uh, leads and enables innovation and CSR initiatives across the whole organisation, many of which are focused on digital skills um, and work to support disadvantaged groups. Uh, in the country. So um, a massive welcome to, uh, to our two final guests. Ooh. OK. Yeah. yeah. We demanded the comfy chairs. <laughs> and we did ask for gin and tonics, but apparently that's not been... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind, Catherine. We're going to have a lovely chat nonetheless afterwards. <laughs> OK. It's lovely to meet you. Um, I was thinking as I drove through today about like the essence of what this conversation is about. And you know, as a journalist, so often you hear like a lot of empty rhetoric, like a lot of people talk the talk, and it's actually really nice to speak to someone about how you actually walk the walk, how you actually put those principles into action. So let's start with, with you. How did you come to join Cisco and how did you come into the role that you're now doing. How do we do this? Um, so I've been at Cisco for 25 years. Um, I always say I never intended to stay. I started as a contractor actually in Cisco Australia. And that's where I started this journey as well. We got a new CEO who said he wanted to make an impact on Australia, not just be a big American company. And that led us to look at partnerships and how we could work. You've got to believe this is back in 1999. So, um, at that point, when we talked to a charity, they were like, oh, speak to the fundraising people or speak to the PR people. It's like, no, 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 I want to talk about more than that. I want to talk about how we could bring everything we are to help. And there were very few organizations that understood that. I came back to the UK and stayed with Cisco here and then carried on that. So always had a sideline. So my main job at that time was in marketing and communication. So I'm a marketer, I'm a communicator, I'm a project manager. Um, but actually, this is what made my life good. This was what brought me the fulfillment. And I ran a sideline of different projects over the years until this role came up where I could do it full time. So for me, I've got the best job in the company because I've got the opportunity to bring all the resources of Cisco to bear on helping other people. And there is no better job in a corporate th to do that full time. Well, just in case anyone isn't familiar with what the program does, can you give us a bit of a, a breakdown? Yeah, so Cisco started this right from the beginning. I often meet my peers at conferences like this, and they say, how do I sell this? How do I convince our executives? So we start with one of those stories that you hear from a lot of American tech companies where they had hopped over the wall to help the little school next door because it wanted technology. I think it even had technology but didn't know how to use it. So we start way back then. Then the biggest program that we've had ever since is around Networking Academy. Uh, we were talking about GCU earlier on, and they're one of our partners in that here in Scotland. So we got to a point in the late 90s where we realized if we wanted to grow as a company, we needed more people to be engineers. We needed more people to understand our products and how networking worked. So we created the curriculum. We go from that to where we are today. Today, there are 3 million students worldwide studying Cisco Networking Academy. Some of those are in traditional spaces, so schools, universities, colleges. But actually, they're also in prisons, homeless shelters, increasingly in refugee camps, because it's using that technology and those digital experiences and those digital skills to change their lives positively. 
So that's been a continuum right the way through. It's a 25-year program. But actually, we then step, stepped back and said, but what else can we do? How are we looking at this? Cisco, again, like many American tech companies, has a foundation in the US who were making grants that were in all kinds of different areas. So we honed it down, and actually, they now look particularly at programs around technology. And so we set ourselves a big goal. And we set ourselves a goal that by 2025, we would have positively impacted a billion people. I'm happy to say that we're now at 848 million. And I'm glad it's somebody else's job. We were talking about collecting data. I am so glad that's somebody else's job to do that. So we go from everything very big to things that are very small. So I, my team here in, um, in the UK and Ireland is three people. So this is not a thing where you can say we've got 40 people. I don't know if I've got anyone here from BT, but we often have an interesting discussion with them where they say, I'll get our people to speak. And I go, yeah, so will I. <laughs> She's called Sam. <laughs> Doesn't matter what the program is, you still get one of the three. That's all there is. Um, and we run programs then that try and take all of that global work and bring it down to local, and local being the UK, which is still not exactly local, is it? Um, and we've got programs that run across digital skills. We've got traditional ones about fundraising. We've got traditional ones about volunteering. And Cisco's really lucky. Every employee at Cisco has 10 days' time to give. So 10 days to volunteer for any educational establishment, any charity, or any faith-based organization. And it really is the case. Our, our tagline for that is about your passion, our time. So we give people the time to go and do that. We encourage them to do their volunteering in programs that we would like them to. But actually, if you want to go and work in, there's a team of 12 going out to Zimbabwe in a couple of weeks' time to work in an animal rescue center, um, that's their passion. And they're going to go and deliver that. And that's fantastic, because that helps with the next stage of what we talk about, which is actually the business mm. goals for this. And there are real solid business goals in this. We are the number two great place to work in the UK for super large companies, so those over 1,000 employees. We're the number one place for well-being um, in the UK. And all of that boils down to lots of things about how we engage our people. So how do we attract talent, and how do we retain talent? And our programs are part of that, because Cisco's a business with purpose. So our purpose is to power an inclusive future for all. But if I just tell you that, you go, oh, yeah, right. But if I tell you, then actually I could introduce you to Sean, who did Network Academy while he was in prison in Wandsworth. He's now been out for 13 years. He runs a team in an IT company in South London. And then you go, oh, they're real things. And then I say, and this is how you can get engaged in that. And it just sparks something in people and it just helps them to develop it. So we go everything from the massive global programs to local ones, but a lot of our work is about engaging our staff, attracting and retaining talent. So there was a lot that you said there that I found really, really interesting when I was taking <laughs> notes. So, so the first thing I want to kind of dig into a bit is, you know, starting that company ethos. You, you said that, you know, they started with the founders and they kind of had this idea of, I suppose, how they wanted the company to, to be. How do you foster that in a company and how do you make it kind of permeate through the company and make it really genuine? Like, how do you think they've done that so successfully? I think probably one of the most important parts of it is we do it first and we talk about it after. So we're, we don't make a huge announcement that we're going to... Um, start this new program. What we do is we start the program, we get some impact results, and then we talk about it. So we start with a position of credibility. Yes. And that's important for people that surround us, whether I'm talking to charities, whether we're talking to government or influencers, or whether we're talking to our staff. I can say, this is how we do it. This is what we've done. Um, and because then, it's not a PR thing. That's the thing. There's no need for the company to do this in terms of often big companies do these great things and it looks wonderful for them, but it's, it's, that isn't the model here at all. It's not, I'm not saying at the end, though, there isn't PR in that. Mm. That would be, you know, you've all seen our announcements from lots of different companies. So there is that element to it. We want to be a brand. We want to be a brand that's recognized. Um, we're not a consumer brand. And that actually changes that dynamic slightly. We're a business-to-business -business company. So as a consumer, you can't buy our products. You, it has to come through two businesses. 
So from that point of view, there, there are PR angles mm -hmm. in it. Of course there are. But it's actually about making sure that you do it first. Mm -hmm. You act, take the action, you get the impact, and then you talk about it, which I think builds credibility uh, for us with all of our stakeholders in this. And then the reality of, of doing that afterwards is to keep moving with the times. Mm -hmm. So Networking Academy here in the UK started in 1999. We set ourselves a goal in 2017 that in the next three years we would train 250,000 people in digital skills in the UK and Ireland. That was as many people in three years as in the previous 17, 18, 17 and a half it was. Um, and that's a bold ambition. But unless you set those targets and make people buy into that and a belief, that coalesces our thoughts. It helps people to feel they're part of something bigger. And that helps us to take that on afterwards. And the other thing that um, struck me when you were talking about Networking Academy, and I suppose it must have evolved over the years, is so often I speak to tech companies and they kind of say, you know, there's these graduates coming out of university, but they don't have the skills that we need them to have. I guess you are circumventing that by training them. Would you say that, that you know, there's benefit to that? Yeah, and they're often trained in universities. Mm. And they're often not... Um, just taking, they're not just studying what we give them. So if you think about a program that we've got with GCU, um, that's looking at reskilling. So not just using our programs to, um, to take through a traditional route, but reskilling people. So Women Do Cyber is a program that we've, we're working on with GCU, where they take a cohort of women who could be unemployed, underemployed, or looking to change career paths. And we put that together. So obviously, the core modules are Cisco Networking Academy and our cyber credentials within that. But actually, it needs that overlay uh, from GCU of the rest of what it takes to bring someone through a program. Um, particularly people, you know, we were talking earlier and saying a lot of these women have not been in, um, in learning. So actually, it needs both of those partners to make that work. So we give them the curriculum but actually the delivery is all done in that area of, of academia or in these sort of alternative places like a, a prison. Well, how, how did you pick where to focus your attention? Because I imagine there's many worthy projects. How does that process happen? There are many worthy projects. And the, I suppose the first thing to say is we don't run all of them. Mm -hmm. So while some people at Cisco will use their time to give to volunteer within a project, other people will own and work within a project, sometimes over many years. We've got a program that we started 13 years ago, which is called Connected Santa. Um, in those days, video technology was very new. And what we did was we went to hospitals around the UK where children were going to be in hospital in that lead up to Christmas. And they had a video portal, video endpoint. They pressed a button, and they spoke to Santa. Now, we know that we didn't. He was sitting in our offices. But the reality was, for them, that it was just a magical experience. Because when Santa spoke to them, he knew their name. He knew who their brothers and sisters were. He knew what football team they supported. He knew what present they wanted for Christmas. Because in the background, Cisco volunteers went into the hospital, sat and did some coloring with them, and asked them loads of questions. Mm -hmm. Then used our technology to give that back to Santa and then start talking. 13 years ago, that was unheard of. So for those kids, that was truly a magical experience. I don't run that program. I've never run that program. My team don't run that program. Mm -hmm. um, but two wonderful women within Cisco run that program and have now, I think they took over from someone else. I think they're now at 11 years of running that program. That's their passion. So they use their time each year to run that program. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that we I do. Love is, that. <laughs> yeah, that it's is amazing just a, program. Because I was going to say to you, how do you, you know, one of the questions here is, you know, how do you measure impact? And I don't even know how you would quantify that. It's quite a difficult one yeah. to sum well, up, we, right? We do what you call the basic bums on seats. So how many kids did you see? How many, you know, it's a thousand but, gifts. But what about the 30. magic factor? How do you even? You don't, <laughs> you don't do it. And, and the feel good factor. But actually, if you flip that on its side, what the other thing it did was it exposed people in the hospital, often the CEO and other people would come to have a look at it. And we talk about Cisco video technology. So That's at, clever. So at the same that time that you're doing the right thing by the child, the child gets a magical experience. The parents 
some of these children can't go to see the traditional Santa in a, um, in a shopping centre or, or wherever you might do it. So we took it to them, to their bedside, if they couldn't move. And so it adds something to that. But there is, and that's why I'm saying a lot of this thing for a business is there's two, always two sides to it. There are things that you do because it's the right thing to do, because it makes you feel good, it makes your employees feel good. But actually, there is a business element to some of these things as well. And we shouldn't, that doesn't make it a bad thing no. to do. It just means you do it for the right reason first. And, and you touched on the example briefly about you know, working with prisons, and, and you've seen real success there. Can you just tell us a bit more about what that particular program looks like? Yeah, so we started, it's probably 15 years ago now, uh, with Networking Academy in prison. So run by the prison service. Um, they do the delivery just as they do with a lot of education in prisons. But if you think about it, this is a skill that's really tangible. It's one of those things where actually if you get to module three, chapter 10, page four, and you come out of prison, you can go to that same place in your local college and pick up exactly where you got to. It's also available in different languages. So if English is not your first language, you can still study it. So it's been hugely successful in engaging people um, and people giving people that skill set to, to carry on. We all know the main reason for recidivism is the fact that when you come out, you don't have a way of supporting yourself. Um, and this gives you one of those ways of supporting ourselves. But the reality is, of course, as companies, we need more people with that skill set. So wherever those people are, wherever their talents lie, and it might not have been exposed to the traditional school system, mm. these are opportunities, whether it's women do cyber, whether it's studying whilst you're in prison, whether it's when you find yourself as a refugee. A lot of focus at the moment, of course, about refugees who came out of Ukraine mm -hmm. um, and helping those people, women, to get those skills to then support their families as they move forward. So, Lots of ways that digital skills make an impact on an individual, and then obviously they can support their families through that. Yeah, because you are literally talking about rebuilding lives there. So, yep. you know, taking on new skills in the context of all that is, is really remarkable. Um, talk to us a bit about the, the current scale of um, your programme. You mentioned a bit that you are doing this with, what, three people you said? How are yep. you doing that? <laughs> There are three of us who run the main programs. Uh, one of my team runs everything that we do around schools. So we've got work experience programs um, in the rest of the UK and England and Wales. We've got T-level programs as well, which is the equivalent to uh, hires, but with a technical focus. Um, that re requires each student to have nine weeks of industry placement. That's huge commitment from the digital industries to give that sort of work. Um, so we run those programs through work experience. We take 300 students a year, um, all of whom will be through state schools, all of whom will be um, chosen on the basis of not their academic qualifications, but on their answers to what are you passionate about in technology and why do you want to come to Cisco? So we don't ask that. I don't care how you know, what grade you're going to get. What I want to find is the people who need our help, people who don't have a network that would normally drive it. The beauty of what happened with COVID is it took us from a place of going, no, no, you can only do this in person, to a place where you could say, actually, we have to. Because if we can't do this online, who can? So we did, we took the whole program online for two years. We're now in a hybrid world. Because actually, one of the skills that all those young people need to learn is about how to work in a hybrid sense. And obviously, the hybrid can be in their home. If they've got access to the right technology, it can be in their school. And so we take those young people. It's not about real work. It's not about saying, could you code this for us? It's about showing them that the, the tech or the digital world has many people with many different skills. And it takes all of them to make a company. So what we try and do is run a curriculum where we expose them to lots of different roles, where we talk to them about what it means to be in IT sales, what it means to run our facilities, as well as what it means to be in our IT companies. And it is all about, we spoke about, somebody spoke about it earlier on, it's all about inspiration and aspiration. It's all about saying, come look at these shiny buildings. We're all quite normal. Please don't judge us in the sense of you think who we are. Uh, my boss, who is the chief executive of Cisco UK and Ireland, doesn't have a degree. Hope he doesn't mind me saying that. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't come through a traditional route. And actually, 
a lot of people have got a lot of different stories. So we try and share them. We role model. So we'll put lots of people in front of them who look like them, a lot of our younger people, and try and get them interested in a, a, a career in tech. Not for Cisco. We only recruit sort of 20, 30 people a year, but actually for tech industry in, overall. And well, the beauty of that is we've separated um, and the need and the problems of location. Because the tech industry, quite a lot of it is based in the southeast of England. Not very much of it, when we talk about our local community, we don't always choose to live in the places that really need our help. So actually, we can use technology to bridge that gap. So I've had the kid from um, the Hebrides. I've had the kids from Inverness. In the UK, I've had the kid from Grimsby and from Sunderland. Which, none of which have a massive tech industry, none of which have a presence of a Microsoft, a Cisco, Amazon, web services, or those sorts of organizations. But because we do this online now, they can be part of it. And the next stage for that program is recognizing that we're about the limit of what we can do, is saying, OK, if we run a bigger online portion, can our partners, so Cisco is a, an indirect sales model, we sell through hundreds of partners right across the country, many of whom are too small to attempt what we try and do in terms of that work experience and exposing kids to the tech industry. But actually, if we help them with a the curriculum and we host the online bits, they could probably do that wraparound for us and bring people into their organizations. So that's what Paul Sam, who works for me, has been tasked with. Her next thing is to work out how to move at scale. So how do we move from 300 a year to 3,000 a year through using other people's time? So a lot of people will be listening to what you have achieved and think, well, how can I replicate that on a smaller scale? Because not everyone has the resource that Cisco does. If someone was thinking, right, I would really like to try and build this into my business model, how do they do it? Well, volunteering, we've heard about already. If Cisco gives everyone 10 days you know, we didn't start there. We started with a program where we encouraged people and we gave people permission to volunteer. And that's really what Time to Give is, if you think about it. It's a program that says, here's 10 days. Very, very few people do 10 days. But what it does is it gives you permission to go out there and do something. And then if we give you two programs that make it easy, then you've got those two bits together. You've got permission to do it and you've got something that makes it easy. Because while we might all sit here and go, but I'm passionate about this, there are a lot of people who've never thought about what they could do for an organization, for a charity, how their skills might be used. So if you give both bits together, and then what you overlay that with is executive support. So when we have, our, we call them check-ins, like a company meeting, they'll talk about our programs. Mm -hmm. We have what we call a community all hands for UK and Ireland, where we don't talk about our sales and our business strategy. What we talk about is our inclusive community, so our ERGs, how women of Cisco are doing things, how our connected black professionals team are doing things. Um, and we talk about the programs we're running and the goals we've set. So I'm currently working towards, we want to volunteer 10,000 hours in May. Um, now, if I tell you that so far in the six months we've done, we've done 24,000. Oh. That's quite ambitious. But the weather's better. Mm -hmm. It's not our year end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've gone through all those loops. But as a smaller business, I think that you can put those things together. You can find a couple of smaller programs that you're passionate about, whether it's working with a local school, whether it's working through specialist volunteering. And then you can give people permission to do that whether that's explicitly through a program or whether it's just by getting people out there role modeling. So um, I ex absolutely expect the execs from Cisco to go out and volunteer at some point or to talk about what they do in their private lives that is volunteering. Because if they role model it, they're giving again that permission for other people to do the same. And that's so important if you want to cement it within your organization and within your culture. You have to keep hitting it, making it easy. You have to make it flexible, but you also have to role model it and make sure people have got permission to do that. Yeah, because you were telling me before that colleagues of yours in Europe very quickly decided they wanted to go and help with the earthquake in Turkey and things like that. And is the company open to that? Like, you know, if you yep. want to go and do something, 
Yes, go. Cool. Well, within reason. So mm. Cisco has a crisis response team um, who are ready to look at whatever a crisis may be. So a crisis may be um, earthquake in Syria and in Turkey. It may be what happens in Ukraine um, following the start of the war. They look at that, and then we separate it into different groups. So first of all, we do what we do best. So someone looks at the technology, and we work with NetHope, with UNHCR, and we look at whether we need to bring in technology, whether they need Cisco products. So we're not there talking about bringing in blankets or food. What we're doing is bringing what we do. And for all the other NGOs on the ground or for the government, we can be that point of connectivity that enables them to behave more efficiently and more effectively in terms of delivering the support that they have. Um, the biggest one where we started with that was a Boxing Day tsunami and how we helped. Lots of things about 9-11 and how we helped there. And that continues. So there's a thread of people there sitting in the US in a global team and about 300 volunteers around the world who are ready to go out and do that very specialist work. Then there's a group of people who put together fundraisers, so straight in there with how do you get match funding. And then there's the, the other bits where it's local to you. So when there was an explosion um, in the Lebanon, in Beirut, it then becomes how can we help the people in Cisco, Lebanon, to support that and what can we do. With what happened in the Ukraine, when that started, we had these 10 days time to give. Actually, for EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, which is our, our region, we had 20 days in that year because that was to support our colleagues in Poland, Romania, and Moldova who were feeling that on the ground, who wanted to go out and help, who needed to go out and help because there were thousands of refugees coming into that country. So there are things you can do immediately, but because you have time to give, you've got permission to go and do that. Yeah, there's um, just a lovely strand of humanity there and just kind of looking out for each yeah. other, which must make going into work, you know, that bit easier sometimes, just knowing that you yeah. are actually doing something that helps. Um, you've been doing this a long time, so <laughs> people sometimes don't like to talk about when things haven't gone particularly well. You know, sometimes when things go wrong, but sometimes they can be great learning experiences. So within the programme, what hasn't worked? Oh, the big constant one. So we... We pilot first and then we change. You know, I talk about work experience. If you had come on the very first work experience, which was 2014, and then you saw what we do today, there is a world of difference. We have bored children to death, I have to say. <laughs> so we do it, we ask them for feedback, and we talk to them genuinely about the fact that when we ask them for feedback, we intend to change. So if they all come back and go, I'm really sorry, but that one doesn't work. Now, apart from the fact that we always get feedback that they want it longer and they want to do real work, and I'm sorry, I know you think you're a coder, but you're not ready to code Cisco product yet. Um, so there are lots of those where we take. So everything we do is an iterative process. Everything we do is about piloting it first and learning from what we do wrong. And yeah, lots of things we do wrong. Lots of things we start thinking we'll get 100 volunteers to do this and only 20 people want to do it. So it's about learning what the outer edges of it are. It's about learning about what the beneficiaries need. It's about talking to charities. I'm sure we are more than guilty of having to try to build a partnership with a charity and talking first, not listening first. OK, that's interesting, um, yeah. But you live and learn. We mm -hmm. have been doing it a long time, and we, we do get better. But I don't think we ever expect a program to start at 100%. Um, you know, I'm sure the team at GCU would accept that, actually, as we go on to our next cohort, uh, we're doing a lot better job than we did with our first cohort. So it's always one of those things, isn't it, that you learn, you take feedback, and you move on. It's how you run your business. It's no different. Yeah. It's just about making sure that you apply those same um, characteristics of your business, your culture, to these sorts of programs as well. And, and what about your proudest achievement? Something that you know perhaps surprised you with its success? Um, I think I've mentioned it already. The Prism program. Yeah. I think that idea of the idea that there are people who would stand up today and say that a program run by Cisco changed their lives. Now we know that's not true. We know they changed their lives. They made that decision. They made, you know, in Sean's case, who was my mentee on that program, he made the decision not to do plastering, which is what he said he was going to do, and to stick with the IT when it, it's not easy. Mm. But the reality is there's that program, there's Netacad around the world, 
Uh, you know, Networking Academy now has had a lot of work done about making it more accessible for people. Um, and so that, and there are young people who work in tech today because a teacher told them that although they never heard of Cisco, they should probably go and try that program. Um, and then who were, and in fact, one of them's in my team. So Melissa only came on our work experience because the teacher told her she had to. Okay. Um, she wasn't interested in anything in tech. She couldn't understand why a teacher would think that a tech company was a good idea. But she came in, she did a rotational graduate um, apprenticeship, and then she ended up in one of her rotations was in my team, and she stuck with it because that's what she's passionate about. She's passionate about helping people, and she's passionate about project managing, and all the skills that she learned around the business, but bringing that to bear on something that changes lives. And, and in terms of picking the right people, is it a tech background that you think they need, or do you think it is that kind of more sort of well, we need philanthropic? Of yeah, so how, how, does the, how do you think that works then in terms of your team? Um, so in my team, it's all about passion and project management, and it helps if you could write. So I, I've got like a balance of all those things. Um, but actually coming into Cisco, um, we run a graduate apprenticeship, and that is about having passion for technology. Um, obviously, if you want to go down a truly technical route, then you also need those technology skills. Most of those we could teach. But actually, there are all sorts of other jobs that we need as well. We need salespeople. Um, we need HR professionals, we need finance people, and so our apprenticeship, although it's with a tech company, isn't exclusively technology-based. But you do need to have a passion for tech to get in. So we ask our apprentices as part of their assessment to do a presentation, and I've seen everything from the Eurovision Song Contest um, <laughs> to you know, something on cybersecurity that was in-depth technical, and everything in between. And actually, the girl who did um, Eurovision Song Contest um, earlier today had a project launched EMEA-wide. So she's still within the apprentice program. But for her um, end dissertation, she's done a soft skills program that she researched through a group that she's part of. It's called Women at Tech. Um, she's created that, and that launched EMEA-wide today. So that's taking one of the skills that we want to see in our um, apprentices but who would have thought someone who did an amazing presentation on the technology behind the Eurovision Song Contest would end well, up Well, you remember her. That's the thing. <laughs> you know, yeah, clever. It is, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you have set very bold, ambitious goals, this One Billion Lives program. It sounds like you're making very steady progress to, to reaching that. Um, when you hit that point, then what? What next? Well, it never goes away. So yeah. yeah. So today, um, at the end of last fiscal year, which for Cisco was last July, um, we were at 848 million, um, and quite a number of those are from our grant programs. So obviously, we make grants. They're still um, technology based, um, but we that's where a bulk of those numbers have come from. But also, 300 a year are from my work experience program. So, and everywhere in between. Um, it won't go away. We're always going to do this. We always have done this. Um, the next goals, well, the, the recent one um, is about climate crisis. Mm -hmm. So how can we bring to bear um, the weight of our people, resources, and knowledge, um, and technology to bear on the climate crisis? The foundation will make $100 million um, in grants to organizations who are using technology to work within the climate crisis. So those, the next sort of iteration of what we do, I think, mm -hmm. is going to be um, a lot more focused towards sustainability, but then to do with the people. It's always going to be a social angle, and that's most of what I do. Yeah, so UK-based projects, or will they be worldwide projects? Worldwide. Quite a few UK recipients so far. Um, you know, think about what the UK does very well. It does innovation. And so with innovation and those startups and those tech startups come people who can then come and look for that sort of funding. So um, a lot of them will come from the UK, even if the projects and the beneficiaries are not in the UK directly, um, a lot of the, the startups are being funded from here. And I'm just keeping an eye on our time because we have to finish at 13 minutes past precisely for some reason. <laughs> so we've got, three, we've got three minutes left. You know, when you took this job all yep. these years ago, would you ever have imagined what you could have achieved? You know, what, what, what are your sort of thoughts looking back on your career? 
I think for me, one of the things that we often talk to young people about is my job didn't exist when I was their age. Um, I come from a, a, a mining village where the aspiration for a woman was to, um, if you were really good, you could be a solicitor or maybe you could work in the bank uh, or you could be a teacher. And that's the life that you know, I started with. So in the sense of where we've come from and what I've been happy to achieve, the idea that we could then move out of that but inspire those people to carry on. Um, I'm, we, somebody mentioned earlier about social mobility. That's our passion. Um, that's my team's passion because a lot of us come from those diverse backgrounds as well. Um, so for me, looking back not just on my career at Cisco but actually my career overall, to come from where I did to go to university, I'm the first one in my family to go to university as well, but then to end up in a place where I can um, you know, give back in that sense of helping to move that forward. Um, and in that scheme of sort of specialist um, skills, um, I sit on the board, so you'd be pleased to know if you were speaking about that earlier. So I'm the vice chair of a board around domestic abuse um, in the area that I live. And that's about taking everything I know at Cisco about how to work with corporates into that charity and trying to help them and bring them along. They were a charity who went, we can't be on social media, it's too dangerous. Um, and I helped them move into the space that they are occupied today. So I think, you know, looking back, it's a jump to where I am. I'm amazed in terms of how much work we've achieved as a team in the time that I've been doing this. But I'm also pleased that we're able to pay it forward as well and help other people take that step up. Yeah, it sounds like you've brought your entire life experience to this role and, and done so admirably. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your warmth and your stories with us. Um, everyone, let's please thank Catherine for her time today. Thank you. Look at that pro, it's finished at exactly, exactly 30 <laughs> minutes uh, past four. Um, fantastic. Have we got, I'm just going to just going to go a bit rogue here. Have we got any questions? Maybe we've got time for one or two questions. It would be a shame not to do this, right? If anyone's got a burning question they'd like to ask Catherine on the stage right now. There we go, excellent. I'm just going to take the microphone. I don't know if we need to know what number of microphone that is. Are these bums on seats now one of the one billion? <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> That's a fantastic short question. Excellent short question, <laughs> short answer. Has anyone else got another question? Okay. Well, listen, uh, one last time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank fantastic. You.